Now, from the Pope John Paul II Cultural Center in Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. Good to see you all. Welcome to the World Over Live. Thanks so much for being here. We've got a show not to be missed tonight. Midterm elections were held in the United States this week, and we'll tell you how the Catholic vote affected the outcome, as well as the pro-life gains and losses in Congress with Congressman Chris Smith and the president of the Susan B. Anthony List, Marjorie Dannenfelser. And later, Dr. Walid Faraz will discuss the recent deadly attack on a Chaldean Catholic church in Iraq, as well as the mail bomb plot originating out of Yemen this week. How are they connected? If you have questions about any of these topics, give us a call. 1-800-221-9460 in the U.S. and internationally, 205-271-2980. Or drop us an email at worldover at EWTN.com. Let's get started. Here's the brief news from the World Over this week. For the third time in three U.S. election cycles, another major shift of power in Washington, D.C. and across the country. This time, concern over President Barack Obama's handling of the economy, federal spending, and the president's deeply unpopular health care overhaul helped propel Republicans to victory, including control of the U.S. House of Representatives. At last count, the GOP will gain control of at least 60 House seats, six Senate seats, and as many as 12 new governorships and 23 state legislatures. The new presumptive Speaker of the House, John Boehner of Ohio, had this to say on the historic election night. We must remember it's the President who sets the agenda for our government. Uh, The American people have sent an unmistakable message to him tonight, and that message is change course. The following day, President Obama took some responsibility for the losses. I'm not recommending for every future president that they take a shellacking like, they, like I did last night. Um, you know, there, I, I'm sure there are easier ways to learn these lessons. Uh, but I do think that uh, you know, this is a growth process and, uh, and an evolution and what we owe them. Is to focus on those and on there. another historic note, when Speaker in waiting John Boehner assumes the office in January, he will become the first Roman Catholic Speaker of the House from the Republican Party. One other remarkable election note to bring you in Iowa: three Supreme Court justices, who in a ruling last year legalized gay marriage, were voted off the state's high bench. That is a first for Iowa. Chief Justice Marsha Turnus and Justices David Baker and Michael Strait did not have opponents. They just failed to garner the simple majority necessary to retain their seats. Campaigns to remove the justices began shortly after the court's 2009 decision to strike down a law protecting marriage. The court's four other justices, all of whom also ruled to legalize gay marriage, face retention votes in the coming years. More about the election, the next Congress, the Catholic vote, and what the Republican victories could mean for pro-life efforts across the country in our next segment. And Catholics around the world are mourning the victims of this weekend's massacre at Baghdad's Our Lady of Salvation Cathedral when Islamic militants stormed and seized the Syriac Catholic Church during Sunday Mass. According to reports, the jihadists immediately shot the priest celebrating the Mass, said they were there to avenge the burning of the Koran, and demanded the release of al-Qaeda prisoners in in Iraq and Egypt. Iraqi forces attempted to free the hostages, but sometime during the siege, at least two suicide vests were detonated, killing more than 50 and seriously injuring another 70. It was the deadliest attack on Iraqi Christians ever. On Monday, Pope Benedict XVI decried the massacre as senseless violence, all the more heinous because it affected defenseless civilians. 
Chaldean patriarch Emmanuel Deli said the Christian community no longer feels safe, not even in the house of God. He predicted that the attack would trigger a new round of emigration as Iraqi Christians look elsewhere for security. And on Tuesday, al-Qaeda's front group in Iraq threatened to escalate the violence against Christians. The so-called Islamic State of Iraq released a statement saying, quote, the killing sword will not be lifted from the necks of the Christians whom they lab labeled as idolaters and infidels. The warning continued, quote, we will open upon them the doors of destruction and rivers of blood, all Christian centers, organizations and institutions, leaders and followers and legitimate targets of the Muhajideen wherever they can reach them, end quote. And in a statement released on the same day, Cardinal Francis George, president of the U.S. Bishops' Conference, offered the prayers of his brother bishops and expressed solidarity with the suffering Christians of Iraq. He also used the occasion of the jihadist attack to hold the U.S. responsible for failing to help Iraq secure its nation. The statement read, quote, We share the Iraqi bishops' concern that the United States failed to help Iraqis in finding the political will and concrete ways needed to protect the lives of all citizens, especially Christians and other vulnerable minorities, and to ensure that refugees and displaced persons are able to return to their homes safely. Having invaded Iraq, the U.S. government has a moral obligation not to abandon those Iraqis who cannot defend themselves. End quote. More about the jihadist cathedral massacre and the plight of Christians in Iraq later in the show. And relations between the church in Cuba and the Castro regime continue to improve. President Raul Castro joined church leaders on Wednesday at the inauguration of a national seminary on the outskirts of Havana. It is the first new religious construction on the communist-run island in more than half a century. Havana Cardinal Jaime Ortega thanked Raul and his brother Fidel and noted that both kept their word to lend the project official support. Cuba's last seminary was taken over by the communist regime in 1966 and was ultimately turned into a police academy. Miami Archbishop Thomas Wensky also attended the inauguration of the new seminary. And Rome's chief a rabbi has criticized a new film about Pope Pius XII as glaring propaganda. Rabbi Riccardo Di Segni said the Italian TV movie, which earned top ratings on Sunday and Monday, was one-sided, full of mistakes, and too quick to dismiss criticism of the wartime pontiff for failing to denounce Nazi racial policies. The film details efforts by Pope Pius XII to save Jews as well as avoid the destruction of Rome during World War II. The film's producer defended it as, quote, balanced and nuanced in its presentation. He also noted that when the movie was previewed for a Jewish audience, none of them were offended. And if you're planning a trip to Washington, D.C., why not attend the World Over? Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, drop us an email at worldoverdc at yahoo.com and we'll reserve a seat for you. We'd love to see you. When we return, Congressman Chris Smith of New Jersey and Marjorie Dannenfelser about the midterm election and the new face of the U.S. Congress. Is it more pro-life? The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. This week's midterm election changed the face of the United States Congress. Republicans will take control of the House of Representatives. The Democrats retain control of the Senate. But there are a few significant Republicans' gains there as well. What does this mean? 
And what of the Catholic vote? To discuss, I'm joined by Congressman Chris Smith of New Jersey, a familiar face uh, to our panel here, who just won election, incidentally, and the president of the Susan B. Anthony List, a nonpartisan pro-life organization, Marjorie Dammenfelser. Thank you both Thank for being you. here. Great to see you, Congressman. You. Now, let's talk for a moment. Uh, let, give me the <clears throat> overarching picture. What was the message of this election, Congressman Smith? Well, it was certainly a game changer. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Americans have awakened both on the economic issue and the morals issue. Of the people who voted, of the 30 percent used abortion as a key indicator as to how they would vote, uh, 22 percent of those people voted pro-life, only eight voted pro-abortion. Mm -hmm. So there's a growing recognition that the unborn child and his or her mother need to be reenfranchised and protected. And if you look at the election results, 52 changes in terms of 30, 38 members who were formerly or districts that were formerly pro-abortion are now pro-life, and 14 members who used to be uh, have mixed records have been replaced by solid pro-life leaders. And certainly Marjorie uh, and her group have done yeoman's work, as did National Right to Life and a few others, to make that a reality. Mar Marjorie, let's talk for a moment. How important was the president's health care reform law? to the outcome of these elections? It was central. It was central. Um, our, we had a program called Votes Have Consequences, and that's mm -hmm. the message of this election from our perspective. Um, there was a group of members of Congress that called themselves pro-life Democrats but didn't behave that way. They, in and you targeted, opinion, what, 15 of these of the 20 um, Democrats who were we, the so-called Stupak Democrats? Right. We targeted 20 of these guys and one woman, and we won 15 out of 20 of those races. Mm -hmm. And on another measure, we, uh, we helped unelect quite a number of pro-choice women who are running. And uh, we, when, we, when there was a Emily's List versus Susan B. Anthony List head-to-head -head matchup, we won 91 percent of those races, which is a really, frankly, a repositioning completely of the women's movement, and the abortion center is falling out, thanks be to God, and new women are stepping in that model. Mm, amazing. Yeah. Uh, w w what can be done tangibly, Congressman Smith, well, about this <clears throat> health care reform bill that seems to be one of the driving engines that uh, made so many independents, and we'll later talk about the Catholic vote, swing Republican? Well, first, I think everyone has to realize this election was a down payment. Mm -hmm. The first step in a two-step. 2012, when some, some 20 pro-abortion senators are up for a re-election out of the 33 or so, uh, I mean, we don't have the Senate. The Senate, best case scenario, will get the 48 to 50 pro-life members of the United States Senate. Uh, so, the, you know, the, it's still going to be very difficult to pass new legislation, although we will try and we will try hard. I've introduced a No Taxpayer Funding for Abortion Act. It has 185 co-sponsors, and across the board, in every aspect, would take abortion out of, of the funding uh, at the federal level, public funding. And Americans want that, and they deserve it. In terms of what can we actually get done, first we can stop the terrible mischief that this president has unleashed, not only on the United States, but the world, will stop to the best of our ability uh, through the appropriations process and through every other means uh, available to us. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the abortion president. Make no mistake about it. He talked about, you know, learning lessons. He has not learned the lesson yet that you should not kill unborn children and wound their mothers and then force taxpayers to subsidize it. I want to play a little bite of the president from his press conference following the election results. Well, listen to this and we'll talk about it in a moment. We'd be misreading the election if uh, we thought that the American people want to see us for the next two years relitigate arguments that we had over the last two years. Now, does that sound like somebody who's willing to compromise? That is not lesson learned. Uh, one thing he did learn was what he should say, which is that there will never be abortion funded in this federal government. He learned what he should say, but he didn't learn that his actions should follow his words. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of his fellow Democrats did the same thing. But voters are much more wise than that. They can't be fooled for very long. He's going to have, look, all we need to do with Congressman Smith is roll back to day one. And then we can start to perhaps protect children at certain stages uh, in, in pregnancy. But right now, we just not need to be complicit in every, in every taxpayer-funded abortion. And, and, Raymond, that kind of rhetoric, really, you know, I've been around, I've been in Congress 30 years. That's like, that's like cheap rhetoric. You know, it's slick. You know, we don't want to relitigate the past. Well, 
it is precisely what you have imposed on the American people. Obamacare, deficits is long, $13.6 trillion of debt right now en route to $26 trillion, and that's with a T, by 2020. It will undo this country if we don't reverse the, the economic and the moral uh, tsunami that he has unleashed upon this country. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's been any Absolutely. lessons learned at this point. There's just a lot of nice slick rhetoric. Well, when you hear things like we're not going to relitigate yeah, the last that? two years, it almost mm. makes sacrosanct what yeah. was passed yes, during mm. this Congress that, quite honestly, it appears now the American people have utterly rejected and it turned out a little so monarchical. Many of the... We will not. I mean, I have, for the last I saw, the voters are in charge. Last I saw, uh, mm -hmm. representatives are accountable to their constituents. I think we will be relitigated. In a moment, I want to talk about the Catholic vote, which swung in a very mm -hmm. interesting and decisive manner. But before we do that, I want to go to the phones to one of those Congress-elect uh, individuals who really has uh, his election to thank to this swing. Sean Duffy joins us from Wisconsin's 7th District. He's joining us via telephone. Sean, uh, first of all, congratulations. Tell me, what, what did you take away from these voters? And we should say, you garnered 52 percent of the vote, your opponent 44 percent. This was a solidly Democratic district. David Obey held that seat for 41 years. What, did you, what is your takeaway here? Well, I, I, in our race, and it's good to be on, Raymond, we were in a, in a situation where people were concerned about the economy, jobs, and this massive debt. But just as your guests are talking about today, I was involved in one of these key races uh, that involved a female candidate who was endorsed by EMILY's List. I was endorsed by Wisconsin uh, Right to Life and National Right to Life. Mm -hmm. And we received the most hateful and dishonest uh, information that came in from EMILY's List. And the bottom line is they wouldn't put their name on it. They would get front organizations uh, like womensvote.org and uh, submit a mail across our district um, and I think trying to mislead pro-life uh, men and women to believe that um, I was anti-woman and they wouldn't uh, set forth who they actually were and what they stood for. Uh, because in our district, uh, it, might be, it might lean Democrat, but it's a, it's a blue dog Democrat district where they're fiscally uh, maybe a little more uh, liberal, but on social issues, they are absolutely conservative and pro-life. Uh, Sean, how decisive was the Catholic vote in your particular race? You know, I didn't see the final numbers, mm -hmm. um, but we worked for the Catholic and the Christian vote uh, throughout our district, and we have an incredibly uh, uh, Catholic uh, 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 district. We have the La Crosse Diocese and the Superior Diocese mm -hmm. uh, in our district, and uh, we worked through the churches uh, quite a bit, and, and we, uh, our message uh, was... Uh, uh, resonating with those voters. And I think with such a stark difference on the issue of life between the two candidates, um, mm -hmm. it really pulled over uh, the Catholic vote and I think uh, put us over the top. Excellent. Sean Duffy, thank you so much for joining us and we'll be looking forward to seeing you here back on the table when you get to D.C. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you, Sean. Uh, th interesting there, his insight. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that in the polling data, in the exit polls that uh, it was the Catholic vote, the Christian vote, which constitutes between Catholics and Protestants 80% of the electorate in this, in this last election. Uh, when you see the kind of swings as we saw, 54% voted Republican. That's up from 42% in 2008. 12 point spread. Why? Why did Catholics swing that way, Congressman? Well, I think, you know, Barack Obama was very effective in downplaying and, and neutralizing the pro-life message when he was running. Uh, and I think finally with Obamacare, in broad daylight, we saw that this was a, another attempt to impose abortion funding, which will lead to a massive increase in the number of actual abortions, because when you subsidize it, you certainly get much more of it, because it's facilitated everywhere. And, and, the, and the language in Obamacare is so sweeping, and it's law, We've got to reverse it, obviously, but I think people have finally begun to wake up. Uh, and many Democrats who happen to also be Catholics mm -hmm. need to realize that it's all about taking seriously our faith to defend the weakest and the most vulnerable am among us. And that's not just the unborn child. It is also his or her mother who is very vulnerable during that, that unintended pregnancy and pressures are brought to bear on her to abort. When you fund it, mm -hmm. facilitate it, provide the means like Planned Parenthood. And, you know, Planned Parenthood uh, is now all over the net saying how and all over in the press mm -hmm. saying that dangerous politicians uh, have now taken over, over to the, the House of Representatives. Where, that is... That is such demonizing rhetoric. And as Sean just said, because I get it too, some of what comes in is so despicable 
And people have to realize when you stand for the unborn child and his or her mother, you will get hit. But we have more and more men and women, and mm -hmm. thanks to Susan B. Anthony List, more and more pro-life women yeah. who are coming to the fore, more doctors, more nurses coming into Congress uh, who will stand up for life. And I think all of that, that demonizing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we got to realize this is the first step, like I said before. There's another election right around the corner. Uh, we need to take America back and move it forward, frankly, back to a place where we respect the sanctity and dignity of life. And it means men and women willing to put their names on the ballot, and we need to support them. Marjorie, I want to, to speak to that point a bit. Uh -huh. There is one Democrat that you unhesitatingly supported, Dan Lipinski in Illinois. He's been on this show. He was a member of that uh, Stupak gang who voted for the Stupak Amendment, which would have protected uh, the, the life of children and uh -huh. barred abortion funding in the health care bill. Once it passed without the Stupak language, mm -hmm. Lipinski voted against the health care mm -hmm. bill. You supported him. He mm -hmm. won his race. Seventy percent of the electorate went to him against a Republican. Absolutely right. Uh, so was the, how important was his pro-life bona fides, and what is the lesson mm -hmm. to be drawn from that race? Well, it's a, that is the question of the day. It is the core of who he is. He has incredible integrity. Um, I know the story of when he was standing up there um, going, and there were the leadership going down the line, are you with me on the executive order? Are you with me? Are you with me? Are you with me? He's the, as if they were school children being told what to do. He was the only one in that entire group that said, I simply cannot do that. My conscience won't let me do it. And this is a man of great integrity. Um, he thinks it's simple. That's what I love about him. It was, it's so easy, so simple. When you could see inside all these other guys just absolutely torn up, torn in shreds, a simple choice for him. Mm -hmm. The voters see integrity. The voters recognize integrity. Voters yeah. who, no matter the climate, can look through and see that. And he's somebody that deserves all our support. He would make Governor Casey proud. Mm -hmm. An amazing, but 70% of the electorate. That, yes. is, a, that is an amazing yes. uh, 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 they know him. turnout. They know him. Yeah, they know him like, like Congressman Smith's constituents know him. Now, what does this do to your pro-life caucus in the House, Congressman well, Smith? Well, our numbers... What has this election done? Oh, it's, it's, it's a tremendous boost. Mm -hmm. uh, the new members coming in, you know, passionate, articulate. You know, Andy Harris, uh, a, a doctor from, 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 from Maryland, comes in with mm -hmm. legislative experience, but also the... the, the Discipline and, and the acunum of, of, of being a, a, a doctor. He's an anesthesiologist. Uh, we have a group of people who are very talented. You know, there's 93 new members and still uh, more to be decided. Uh, Steve over, Shabbat coming back. Steve Shabbat. Here's yep. the yeah. guy that led Returning. the effort on partial birth mm -hmm. abortion. Mm -hmm. A seasoned, very effective uh, lawyer who is also mm -hmm. uh, was the chairman of the Constitution Subcommittee. Uh, we, we've got some of the best back who ran again after being defeated you know, when the Democrats took over under Nancy Pelosi, but also a large number of people. Plus, let's not forget, many new governors who are pro-life, 14 right. changes that went our way, 20 or so chambers of the legislature throughout the country that flipped to Republican and, and most great likely men to be very pro-life. I mean, Susanna great Martinez, oh, yes. who I ran into mm -hmm. in D.C. At, at, at a luncheon once, mm -hmm. a great uh, Hispanic prosecutor, mm -hmm. uh, amazing woman. She's the sure. new governor of yeah. uh, New Mexico. Yeah. Uh, there are outstanding candidates we see across the country. Mm -hmm. Again, pro-life, uh, many of them Catholic. Yeah. Right. The Speaker of the House, John Boehner, John Boehner, a very different type of Catholic, I think, than the one we've been seeing. Uh, <laughs> tell me how this is going to play out. Uh, what is your, what's your thought on this, Marjorie? Well, I know that... Uh, uh, top Pelosi priority. could be a tough character when she got behind closed doors, <laughs> I am told. Well, we, oh, yeah. We've been ready for a new brand of Catholic for a long time at the mm -hmm. helm. And he's made very clear his commitment to the Smith bill. Um, he, we have been working on that for a long time with him. We expect that to be a first priority. What's the priority. Smith bill? Don't, don't assume that The Smith knows. bill, I'm sorry, is what Congressman yeah. was... Um, con the Smith-Lipinski bill will roll back all federal funding of abortion. It and on Obamacare as well. Uh, yeah. Across the board. Right. Uh -huh. and, and enshrine mm -hmm. the Hyde language all as part the, of all, all the different law. writers that we have to renew annually uh -huh. that right. are always at risk. This mm -hmm. would make them permanent. Right. Uh -huh. so, right. And right. John Boehner has made it very clear because he's co-sponsor and a very strong, strong pro-life uh, speaker-elect, uh, as is the rest of our leadership. You know, we have men and women who, in leadership positions who are passionately pro-life. It's not some ancillary issue that they, they go through the motions. 
in their heart of hearts, they believe and they know why they believe mm -hmm. and will articulate that message. Right. We're getting some calls and emails. I want to get to these Good. first, but I also I have to point out uh, the, the, there was a fellow who was uh, in the House of Representatives, Tom Piorello, or, or, or uh, Periello, yeah. who uh, was in a Virginia congressman. Mm -hmm. He was a Democrat. He was a mm -hmm. founder of uh, the Catholics in Alliance for the Common Good, a left of center Catholic right, group right. that kind of mm -hmm. fudged these life issues. He went down to defeat mm -hmm. in his election. Oh, yeah. We've met squeaker, with a lot of these he... groups. Catholic mm -hmm. United was at every stop on our bus tour throughout these districts. Catholic United opposed the Stupak Amendment, which would have stripped the pro. The, the pro-abortion um, funding language in, in the health care bill. Uh, there are, you, I, I know that you cover them here. Mm -hmm. They are there to be smoked out, and, and they mm -hmm. cause trouble wherever Catholics they go. Catholics United and Catholics uh, in, in Alliance for the Common Good. Now, right. one of them is out of money. What, is it mm -hmm. a Catholics for Alliance? I mean, these are kind of shadow organizations. There's nothing well, behind them. Catholics There's no United membership. has a lot of Soros money behind mm -hmm. it, so I don't think they're ever going to um, die, run out of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there is a lot of money behind the idea that they would like to move into the pro-life movement, which is that which is what they're doing now. Mm -hmm. And what does that um, mean, move into the pro-life? When movement? I say that, they're co ah. they they're they're not only that, but bringing uh, lawsuits, uh, trying to oh, uh, trying to put mm -hmm. a lot of money mm -hmm. into uh, looking into um, false lawsuits, which we have been on the other end of in this election, mm -hmm. and all kinds of uh, discovery. It's all about the pro-abortion front group. Mm -hmm. Just like Catholics for Free Choice, right. which is not Catholic, no. yeah. made up of people who are who have a hatred for the Catholic Church, and it manifests most severely in in their well, promotion the, of the primary return. example would be at the very at the very end at the very end when we were trying to really get good language in the bill, um, the the head of the Catholic Health Care Association. Um, the, the, yes, the sister, sister, sister well, you Carol Kean, you came, came, right. Sister Carol Kean came in mm -hmm. and gave cover to all these guys, and she will be remembered. She should be remembered by faithful believers forever as someone who can do. One person can do that much damage. Mm -hmm. Look at one person can do on the other no, side. No, defied the bishop. She was called out by the bishops of the United States for defying them in, in, in their teaching, and it distorted again. Having a nun going out there and distorting and and manipulating Catholic teaching in the public mm -hmm. domain, and it preys on the ignorance of reporters and the mm -hmm. public at large and caused untold damage in the House. Mm -hmm. uh, but hopefully all of this will yeah. help re resettle things and resituate them. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, uh, an email for you, Congressman Chris uh, Smith. Title 10 provides funds to provide free birth control drugs to teenagers and others. Talk about how this uh, is a waste of taxpayer money, and given the economic situation, can and will the House deny funding for Title 10, if not why? My hope is that since Title 10 is the prime way that the federal government provides money to Planned Parenthood and other pro-abortion organizations who are on a building spree, let's not forget that Planned Parenthood alone kills 325,000 babies in its clinics every year. Disproportionately young teenagers, uh, they do it especially in states where there's no stricture, uh, without parental notification or consent. So a secret abortion uh, is procured for a teenager. Uh, when the aftermath hits and she's suffering or hemorrhaging, uh, who does she turn to? Hopefully mom and dad. But there's this organization uh, doing this terrible work. Title 10 is the conduit uh, by which huge amounts of federal subsidy goes into their coffers. They claim they don't use it for abortion. They use a simple bookkeeping uh, you know, gimmick mm -hmm. uh, to segregate the funds. But we're not even sure that always happens. But right. say, say it does. Who cares? We're enabling the largest pro-abortion organization on earth through the Title 10 program. Mm. And, and it's happening with other groups as well, because it doesn't just go to them. Well, th this is another email that kind of plays to the same point. This is uh, Sarah, and she writes, is it possible to reinstate the Mexico City language and policy, uh, which uh, at present we are funding these pro-abortion clinics outside the U.S. with? Well, Florida. as it stands now, <clears throat> especially with the Senate being below a, a simple majority, mm -hmm. uh, and even if we got the 50 votes, which is possible, especially if we win the Miller race, um, it will still mean, frankly, that the tiebreaker is broken by Joe Biden. Um, we will try. I will try. I look forward to the fight of exposing what Barack Obama has done and Hillary Clinton in promoting abortion all over the world, in Africa, Latin America, uh, in Ireland, and all over the world. They have been working overtime with my dollars and yours to promote the abortion on demand agenda. In like manner, they've been promoting forced abortion in China. Oh, they say they're against it, but they give money to the U.N. Population Fund, 
which has been found over and over again to have a hand in glove relationship uh, with the Chinese dictatorship where where gender side is rampant. They're missing 100 million girls in China. So we will look at these foreign aid programs. And my hope is that we will be able to put Mexico City policy in at some point uh, and we, I will certainly Through try. Through the legislature. And it'll be, exactly. it'll be a wonderful sight to behold to have that bill laid before the president and see whether he's willing to sign it or not after he's mm -hmm. been very uh, clear about not being for a taxpayer funding of abortion. Did you see this story where the Health and Human Services Department is uh, acting on a petition from the ACLU deciding whether or not they will compel Catholic hospitals mm -hmm. to provide abortions under the health care rubric? Right. Have you seen this? I, I have seen it, and it has been an ongoing war. At the very end of the Bush administration, the Obama, uh, they uh, promulgated uh, protections for health care workers. Um, and then as soon as Obama got in office, he overturned those, um, which means that uh, there's no protection for a, a medical school student who doesn't want to have to learn. The only, there's only one way to learn how to do an abortion. That's to perform one. Mm -hmm. Med students ought not be compelled to do that. There are a whole range of uh, certainly religious hospitals ought to be protected from having to perform abortions. But the mm -hmm. ACE, now this so is right where... they're saying it's under consideration. Yeah. Oh, so they're uh, not, they didn't rule it out under... under well, under there are no healthcare. conscience clauses in the health care plan yes. as it yeah, stands yeah. today. Right. That's right. And not only that, but it's very clear that the ACLU knows that health care is considered under the law to be include, abor include abortion. And so Raymond, they're very again, willing to test this. Margie's actually right. Uh, this is a, a global push by the abortionists to compel conscientious objectors to provide abortion or get out of the business. Mm. They want to make it so that the only OBGYNs that out there or nurses will be who deal with obstetrics will be pro-abortion minded because the others have been self-selected right. out. Mm -hmm. Obama amazingly withdrew the Bush regulations as, as Marjorie said. Uh, there's three laws that say health care workers and, 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 and um, uh, practitioners in the field have conscience rights. He says and you got to promulgate regulations to to effectively implement those rights. Right. He pulls back the regulations, so we're in no man's land. The ACLU wants to, as do others, want to compel. It's all about compelling conformity to the abortion mm -hmm. culture. That's why this election is so important. I want to go to the phones. Noreen from Massachusetts, you're on the World Over Live. What's your question, Noreen? Hi, I have a question for Congressman sure. Smith. And um, in Massachusetts, the government funded uh, health care is from MassHealth. And covered under Mass Health is abortion services, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if this is legal because the government isn't supposed to be funding abortion services. Well, absent a specific language in that state law, it's it's legal, and that's mm -hmm. precisely what our argument was with Obamacare and that so-called executive order, which was just a sense of uh, like an opinion, a fig leaf mm -hmm. that didn't have the rule of law. The Stupak Amendment and the Stupak Pitts, I should say, Amendment did. Mm -hmm. But that was rejected by the Senate and certainly watered down and became a, a nothing burger, if you will, mm -hmm. when it came back to the House. So we're, we're dealing with an open season on unborn children. And again, if President Obama means anything he says about lessons learned, learn that Americans don't want to subsidize abortion. Mm -hmm. It is the killing of mm -hmm. children. It is the absolute wounding of their mothers. Okay. If you fine. don't know it any other way, you'll okay. lose your election because you did it. Right. It doesn't right. make political sense anymore. <laughs> no. I mean, particularly in that no. Lipinski right. race, yeah. you see, and, and uh, why is the Democratic Party so hard-headed on this point when it seems to be a, a bump politically? Mm -hmm. This is a plus or a wash at worst. Well, so we, why yeah. are they so hesitant and resistant mm -hmm. to embracing this pro-life cause, particularly Catholic Democrats, which mm -hmm. is where the, the, the Catholic Church found its... That was sort of the cradle of Catholicism for so many decades. Without, without question. Well, there's two conflicting desires. One is to hold the majority. The other is to be a true believer. And the, and the leadership in the Congress of the Democratic Party are true believers in the idea that uh, having an abortion is just another health care procedure. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the truth. And whenever I debate now President, um, who I, you, you know, do very often, she, her point and all of their point is that if it is just another health care procedure, then it is wrong of you to deny this. And it is discrimination of women mm -hmm. if you deny her this procedure. 
well, you wouldn't deny her a kidney transplant. Why deny her an abortion? Mm -hmm. So that's what the true, true believers believe, believe. However, when they wanted to take over the majority, they realized we better run some guys who are pro-life in these districts because the American people aren't putting up with it. Well, now there's a natural correction that's happened. And we see And, and real quick, Carlson, I do yeah. think there needs to be a reappraisal within the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. uh, they used to be the party of the little guy, you yeah. know, the, the little gal. Uh, they've lost that. They have become the wholly owned subsidiary of Planned Parenthood and NARAL and the abortion groups. And when they say jump, they say how high. And, and in a way, it's a straitjacket for the Democrat Party. My hope is that Catholic and all other Democrats of conscience will realize that they have enabled and facilitated a holocaust of children. 52 million babies have been killed in America. And what's our major export now? The abortion ideology to Africa and elsewhere. Uh, that is shameful. Mm -hmm. And that is, it's, it's a violation of human rights. Very quickly, uh, what, g give me your one or two uh, legislative targets and policies that you think will pass as a result of these elections regarding these life issues. Number one, the, uh, the Smith-Lipinski bill has to pass, has to be number one on the docket to have a uh, federal-wide ban on abortion funding where we're not complicit in, in all these abortions that are taking place every day. That's number one. Number two for us would be to ban federal funding of Planned Parenthood, the number one abortion provider in the nation. Mm -hmm. We ought not be in the business of propping up abortion providers uh, that don't have no intent on serving women but just providing them an abortion and, and then leaving them abandoned. Congressman well, Marjorie said it well. Yeah, but how do you, <laughs> how do, you do that? How do you do that without a Senate and with a president who's going to veto everything? We do it with passed. prayer, with faith, with legislative tenacity. We do not give in for a moment. The lives of children hang in the balance. The lives of the mothers hang in the balance. And frankly, the family, which has been so fractured in our abortion culture, our culture mm -hmm. of death. Uh, if we care about the family, that's why Catholics and men and women of faith and goodwill need to step up to the plate and stop trivializing this terrible issue called abortion on demand. Mm -hmm. It is destroying our culture, and it mm -hmm. certainly has destroyed many very And we'll good. flood all these districts. With anybody who's even marginal on this, we will be flooding their districts. We'll make sure that yeah. they're... And Raymond, real quick. I'm out of time. Quickly, right. quickly. Go ahead, Congressman. <laughs> Marjorie and the pro-life movement has mm -hmm. held, you know, uh, national right to life. The groups that have worked tenaciously to bring this message mm -hmm. forward uh, are now holding, as never before, people to account. It matters to be pro-life, and my hope is that more men and women will say, that's where my vote will be. Very good. We'll leave it there. Congressman Chris, uh, Marjorie Danspelser, thank you for being here. For more on the Susan B. Anthony List, visit their website, sba-list.org. And Congressman Chris Smith is always at chrissmith.house.gov. When we return, Dr. Walid Farez on the rise of global jihad and the targeted Christians of Iraq. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Earlier this week, we saw a horrific attack on a Chaldean Catholic church in Baghdad, as well as a mail bomb plot that originated in Yemen. These events seem to signal an increase in terrorism that is religiously targeted. My next guest is an expert on global jihad and Middle Eastern affairs. He's a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and author of the soon-to-be-released The Coming Revolution, Struggle for Freedom in the Middle East. Would you welcome Dr. Walid Ferris back to the program? Thank, Thank you. you so much for being back. Thank you. Let's talk about this uh, explosion, this terrible hostage situation, and, and the carnage that happened in this Chaldean cathedral. 58 killed, two priests among them, 75 wounded. You had these suicide bombers blowing themselves up. Is this meant to drive the Christian population here away? to spook them and send them scattering. Absolutely. And actually, Al-Qaeda in Iraq and the jihadist movement worldwide and in the region is not shy about that. They are basically calling for the withdrawal, for the ethnic cleansing of the Christian population of Iraq, which is among the oldest Christian populations in the Middle East. But, 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 Dr. Ferris, why are they bothering about this tiny population? I mean, their, their, their population is now cut in half. 
from what it was before the, the, the whole Iraqi uh, war. Mm -hmm. Why are they concerned about this fledgling community that for decades and centuries have peacefully coexisted with them? Because the presence of multiple religious groups creates what? Pluralism. It creates democracy. It creates diversity. diversity. They are against diversity. What they want to establish is a Taliban-like model in Iraq, in Egypt, in Jordan, in Saudi Arabia. And what did the Taliban do? They suppressed every single other religious group in addition to Muslim moderates. So it's not just mm -hmm. anti-Christian, it's anti-freedom in general terms. And the jihadists in Al-Qaeda in Iraq have been systematic. This is not the first event. This is the worst event so far. But they have been targeting the Christians We've for spoken while. about this before, and I think it's important to define. We're not talking about Islam. We're talking about political Islam. Explain that to people, because it's very hard to distinguish, I think, particularly for a Western audience watching in Europe or, or in the United States. Well, it's very simple, although it is complex. You have Islam as a religion, and you could do debates, theological debate, as we do in the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. among Christians, interfaith. Mm -hmm. Then you have the Muslim community worldwide, and then you have a group which is about 5 to 7 percent of the entire Muslim world, which basically calls itself Islamist. That's uh -huh. a political movement. And those who are violent among them call themselves jihadists. That's why we call them the jihadi terrorists. Mm. Now, do you buy their explanation? They're saying the, the entire reasoning for uh, invading this church and, and causing and threatening havoc on all Christian centers, organizations, institutions, followers, and legitimate targets of the Muhajideen, wherever they can reach them. And they say here that, uh, they refer to the Pope, the hallucinating tyrant of the Vatican knows that the killing sword will not be lifted from the necks of their followers until they declare their innocence from what the dog of the Egyptian church is doing. Now, let's put grammar aside yes. because there's some problems there. But they are, they, they're, they're saying, and they're using as a justification, uh, two women that they claim converted to Islam who are being held hostage in Egypt, an Egyptian monastery. What do you make of this? You know, Raymond, over the past 30 seconds, everything you said, quoting them, mm -hmm. seems coming from medieval ages, yeah, right? It's, it's the, 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 the satanic thing and the head of the church and we're going to you know, go against the Christians of Egypt. This is something that does not belong to the 21st century, does not belong to freedom and pluralism and the very basic rights of human rights around the world. The jihadists who did violence in Iraq are the same who in Egypt have been kidnapping mm -hmm. females for the last 20, 30 years, have been persecuting the cops. The cops in Egypt are the largest Christian community in the Middle East, yep. 15 million. That's four times the size of the entire Palestinian or Israeli population combined. There are more Christians in Cairo, 1 million, than the entire population of Gaza. And it is a persecuted population. I mean, it, I remember visiting there almost 20 years ago now, and my translator was a young 18-year-old girl, Catholic girl, a copt. And um, she had a little cross on her neck, and I noticed every time she went out, she would put it inside her blouse and button it up. And I said, why do you do that? She said, I don't want to be beat up by the boys. Because friends of hers had bruises all over, and the nuns were beaten up. And I mean, it was terrible. They would physically abuse these women, if not rape them with the intent of, of uh, then, they, they thought, destroying their religiosity. By well, well, look, if act. you go on websites of the cops, and there are many, and also the Christians of Iraq, mm -hmm. the entire Middle East Christians, you will see persecution clearly. You will see the pictures. You will see the documentation. You will understand that for the last 20, 30, maybe 40 years, there have been a systematic persecution of the 18 to 25 million people living in the Middle East between mm -hmm. Armenia and Sudan. So this is a very pressing issue for our government and now this Congress and the entire United Nations to mm -hmm. go after, to address. Uh, we're joined by Bishop Sarhad Yamo. He is the, uh, of the epar eparchy of St. Peter the Apostle. Now, he's in San Diego, but he is a Chaldean, and these are his brothers and sisters and our brothers and sisters. The Chaldean faith is, is part of our, the Eastern Catholic faith. Uh, Your Excellency, thank you so much for joining us. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to speak about uh, a really dramatic, tragic, uh, very urgent, very alarming situation in, in the whole Middle East, but especially in Iraq. Now, Iraq is the, 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 the stage, the scene where barbarism, where, where ferocity where of, 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 of really dark forces is exercised in, in front of the eyes of the whole world. and, mm -hmm. and and how can the American army 
be there. This is this is seven, eight years is there. Mm -hmm. And this is happening in front of our eyes in plain day. So this is very alarming. Mm -hmm. And I, I call on on every uh, every person man of goodwill. This is not something that could be tolerated in our time and world. Mm -hmm. So something must be done. And amazingly, even an inquiry, an investigation, yeah, that hasn't happened is yet. not even 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 uh, uh, somehow uh, activated uh, under the auspices of, of international organ institutions, and especially uh, endorsed by our country here, mm -hmm. United States. Uh, let us start with an inquiry. I mean, how can this happen? without even having an inquiry internationally verified to reach to the bottom of the truth. Who is behind it? Bishop Yellow. Why the government is not, the Iraqi government is not doing anything about it? Why United States, our, yeah. our country is there, is on the ground? Bishop Jamo, I, before we run out of time, I, I just want to ask you this. Considering the discrimination that the Chaldeans are facing on the ground and the tolerance of the Iraqi security forces for this kind of extremist violence, what are your hopes for the people of the Chaldean faith there? And do you think they can remain, or will it be scattered throughout this diaspora? Really, how long can you, can you, can anyone absorb this kind of uh, of atrocity. How long? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we were there, Chaldeans in Iraq, were there for thousands of years now, persecuted. Uh, I mean, Taimur Lang, uh, Hulago, the, the, the Turkish Ottoman even genocide that happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and until now, they survived, Christians of Iraq, mostly Chaldeans. Mm -hmm. They survived. Chaldeans are 99% Catholic. Mm -hmm. They survived. Can you imagine that now? Yeah. They cannot survive. And sure, if that is, that is their fate, if the world is just watching, mm -hmm. then at least do something for them to go somewhere safely. Yeah, and fine. Give them a safe peace. harbor. Yeah. Bishop Jamal, thanks so much for joining us. And we certainly will not stop reporting this story. We've been covering this for a yeah. long time, and we'll, we'll keep up with you. Uh, Dr. Ferris, in, in previous appearances on the show, it was suggested by Nina Shea and others mm -hmm. that uh, th th there could be a land set aside mm -hmm. so that the Christians could at least find safe harbor and protection now. That has not been forthcoming. What is the answer here? See, the, the bishop has a great point. With regard to our U.S. foreign policy, mm -hmm. how is it possible that in the 90s we went to Yugoslavia twice, mm -hmm. to Kosovo and to Bosnia, to, stop to, save, to save and protect Muslim population? Mm -hmm. And we did the right thing. Mm -hmm. And now we have been in Iraq for the last many years. We are on the ground, and we see in front of us Christians being massacred and ethnic cleansed, knowing that many of those families have relatives in large communities here in America, the cousins to Americans. 120,000 citizens of Chicago are Chaldean and, and Assyrians, same and go for, for Detroit. Now, the point is, yes, we should help the Chaldean, Assyrian, Christian community in Iraq mm -hmm. to form their own autonomous area. Mm -hmm. That's the federation. That's the principle of the Iraqi constitution. Why don't we apply it for them as we applied it for the Kurds, for example? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. It's like we have a don't ask, don't tell policy toward terrorists in you know, foreign policy speaking from the United States. It, it makes no sense. Let's move on to this Yemen bomber. These were packages sent uh, intended for sh two Chicago synagogues. Mm -hmm. I guess the addresses were old and it wouldn't have gotten there anyway. But nonetheless, that was the intention. What do you make of this? And again, we see a religious target at the other end of this bomb. Absolutely. Look, what we have in Yemen today are two things. The infantry of Al-Qaeda, people with AK-47s, people who are fighting the government there. But then you have something new that we need to pay attention to. The techies, people who are mm. technologically savvy, Two of them, at least, at least their leader, are American citizens. Imam al-Awlaki, they know exactly our system. They know we, how we are affected. They look at the weak spots, and the weak spot was to what? 
UPSS or FedExs couple bombs. They're looking always for the ways to get those explosives into our homeland, and that is happening not out of context. Even on the homeland, on the inside, we see a rise in the jihadi activity. So it's all mm -hmm. coming together to try to hurt our national security and hurt our national economy. Well, we also see this Farouk Ahmed in Ashburn, Virginia. This is just a stone's throw from D.C., a suburb of Washington, D.C., and the FBI arrested this man. Why is it so troubling? Because he is amongst us and because he is one of us. A and naturalized citizen. He's a naturalized citizen, and this is happening in our neighborhood. This is not somebody thrown by the Taliban into a high-profile place in New York, mm -hmm. as was the case with the Times time Square bomb, or some shoe bomber. This is someone who is living in our neighborhoods. And what was he doing? And he was trying to look at targets, including trains, metro stations, other potential targets. And my concern is not that, you know, he only. How many other jihadists like this guy are among us? How many other people have been indoctrinated and incited and are now living among us? That's the very and dangerous what can situation. We do? What can we do? Where has the government dropped the ball regarding this kind of homegrown terrorism and being watchful? Of I could it? give you a very long list, but there is something that has happened over the past two years of the previous administration and the, mm -hmm. certainly the past two years of this administration which is that there was a ban put by this administration on the use of words and terms and ideological concepts that would allow the analysts in defense and in homeland security and in national security to understand where is radicalization. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, don't use the term jihad. Don't use Islamization. Don't use the caliphate, the Salafis. These are the exact words we need to use so that we can detect radicalization. And mm -hmm. we are like blind. We are like finding a wall without radar if we can't use these concepts. It's, it's remarkable. Now we hear that in Hezbollah mm. has moved into Lebanon, Christian Lebanon, into the Christian area, and is occupying it. What is this about? And why have we heard so little of it covered in the United States? Well, I guess because we're covering Britney Spears and Lindsay yeah, Lohan. Yeah, that's more and, important, and, strategically yeah, speaking, uh, of course. Char Charlie Sheen. That's going to really save us when these people are blowing up our metro stations. But what is this about? This is 40% Christian in Lebanon. What is happening there now with Hezbollah? What has been happening at least since May of 2008 is that Hezbollah is conducting what I call an urban jihad. They are moving to neighborhoods of the Sunnis, of the Druze, and now lately within the neighborhoods of the Christians who are about 40% of the country placing their cells and getting ready for the seizure of the entire Christian community in Lebanon. So we're talking about attack against the Christians in Iraq, attack against the Christians in Egypt, and now potential coming, forthcoming offensive against the Christians in Lebanon. But these people aren't doing anything. They're living. They're really not political players. They, uh, I mean, I've spoken to a lot of Lebanese Catholics, and they will tell you, look, we're just living our life. We've always lived in harmony and peace. We just want to keep doing that, and we are doing that. But they're not being allowed to do that. Why? Because they're living their life. They shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, they shouldn't, shouldn't be doing that. They should be Hezbollah. They should be mm -hmm. supporters of Hezbollah. They should be supportive of the Khomeini regime. They should be supportive of the Islamic Republic. So they should change their identity. Mm -hmm. That's the real war in the Middle East. They want to force the minorities, the Christian minorities in the Middle East, and other minorities, Muslim minorities as well, and people who are seeking freedom to change into what the jihadists want the Middle East to become. Mm. What, what is the answer? What should the government be doing now that we aren't doing? Well, the United States administration should immediately make a statement about Hezbollah and warning Hezbollah and warning mm -hmm. Syria behind Hezbollah and warning Iran that any crossing of that red line in Lebanon means business, means Security Council resolution, meaning we will, you know, make sure that Hezbollah will not control security Lebanon. Security Council resolution? Walid, this week the United States is submitting itself to a U.N. human rights review where it will be subject to... Uh, claims of terrorism, not closing Gitmo, the death penalty uh, continuing, religious freedom will be questioned, and, uh, and apparently immigration, free immigration across the borders. But, 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 All of these are violations of human rights. Iraq, uh, uh, or rather, Cuba, Libya, China, yeah. Saudi Arabia will be questioning the United States. Yeah, they have the highest level of human rights abuse. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> That's why they are on the Human Rights Council. It is. We are in a very strange era. It is, I'll say. Well, thank you for helping us try to get out of it and, and understand you. it better. Dr. Walid Farah is in the Foundation.
Coalition for Defense of Democracies is available online at defenddemocracy.org. Great website. And look for Walid's new book, The Coming Revolution, Struggle for Freedom in the Middle East. You see it on your screen. That comes out December 7th. Fascinating read. Well, that is all the time we have until next week. You can find updates and the occasional commentary by following me on Twitter at twitter.com slash Raymond Arroyo or on my Facebook fan page. And Christmas is coming to that end. The prayers and personal devotions of Mother Angelica is still in bookstores everywhere. Makes a wonderful gift, as does my latest project, the only Catholic fully dramatized word-for-word audio Bible available anywhere. It's called The Truth and Life Dramatized Audio Bible. Michael York, Brian Cox, Blair Underwood, and other incredible actors bring the scriptures to life as never before. If you go to RaymondArroyo.com, you can find much more information. Click the banner up top, and uh, that will redirect you to EWTN's religious catalog where you can order a special EWTN edition. Until next week, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye now.